a queen falls, but Scarlet on the regroup is. Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god! The trial of their feet! Scarlet, the most incredible game! In many ways, StarCraft gave birth to esports as we know it. From literally being launched into space to drawing thousands of rabid fans to arenas, it was a legit esport before the word was even invented. In terms of the sheer number of participants, the coverage, and the money at stake, StarCraft used to be the biggest esport on the planet. But now, it's hard to feel like it really even matters. So what happened? What toppled the king of esports? To give you an idea of just how huge StarCraft was, 120,000 people showed up to watch the StarCraft Sky Pro League Finals in 2005. That's 40,000 more people than were in the arena for the Super Bowl that same year. Meanwhile, this year, StarCraft streams were lucky to even hit 85,000 people. And that's for people watching from the comfort of their own home. But to understand why StarCraft fell, we have to understand what made it so great in the first place. Lego, Lego! When Brood War came out, about a year after StarCraft uh, came out, the game became really, really popular in Korea. So popular that even people who didn't play computer games knew about it, and they, they even knew about the best players, who they were, because they were on television so much. Back when gamers were still considered basement-dwelling losers in the West, pro StarCraft gamers in Korea were revered as gods. Got in a taxi coming from the airport, and there was a poster and I think it was a boxer advertising something or other. And, you know, I, I think I made some sort of remark. And the taxi driver then proceeded to tell us that he was training to become a professional gamer. And this guy was probably in his 60s. And yet <laughs> here he was, you know, going down to the, uh, the LAN cafe, the PC Bangs, um, every other day after work to practice brutal. And it was only then I suddenly just went, OK, this is kind of crazy shit. This is way bigger than it is in the West. The best of the best were given the title Bonjoie, a title that came from holding the love of the people, not just dry statistics and records. And in Korea, StarCraft matches were broadcast on television and eventually spawned entire channels dedicated to broadcasting the game. Korean StarCraft teams were even sponsored by corporate giants like Korea Telecom and South Korea Telecom. So what happened was is these PC bangs sprung up all over Seoul and all over Korea, which allowed players to go in and spend free time at very little cost on high quality PCs of the time anyway, and they all came preloaded with Brutal. So suddenly you've got all of these things combining, TV looking for you know new stars, sports people looking for new sports stars, brands looking for young males in particular, but also women to advertise their products. And here comes this massively popular free, effectively free game that people can play in PC bangs. And so it was a perfect storm. All of these things combined to allow StarCraft and Brewboar in particular to just rise up out of nowhere. And within a couple of years, they had TV stations devoted to the, to the games and to the leagues. By the mid 2000s, StarCraft had a fully built out esports infrastructure in Korea one that was used as a model for the West. But StarCraft got so big so fast that there was little room for growth. By 2006, StarCraft hadn't been patched in five years, which is insane given how often games get patched these days. As far as the StarCraft community was concerned, the game had been figured out. There were no more new moves to make, no more new strategies to develop. That is, until Jadong showed up. Jadong's rivalry with Flash, the greatest StarCraft player of all time, revitalized the game. With these two, you don't need qualifiers. These are actually just the greatest gamers ever. But at the end of the day, they were still playing a decade-old game. The StarCraft community needed something new. Hell, it's about time. StarCraft II Wings of Liberty was the beginning of a new chapter for the game. Slowly but surely, it pushed Brood War out of the competitive arena. And for a few glorious years, StarCraft II was the biggest eSport in the world.
unlike Brood War, Wings of Liberty was bigger than just South Korea. Guys, make some noise. Stefano is the WCS European Champion. StarCraft II was unstoppable. At least, until Heart of the Swarm happened. Heart of the Swarm was StarCraft II's first expansion, and any hype the community had going in was quickly deflated by a pretty severe drop in game balance. The big problem were Swarm Hosts, a Zerg-only tool that could basically spawn infinite units without the need for gas or minerals. The Swarm Hosts, I think, is the worst thing to come to StarCraft II. And if all that is gibberish to you, all you really have to know is that Swarm Hosts were broken. I, I don't think he has any plan. <laughs> uh, I've, I've lost all comprehension of what he could do from here. There is no answer. I really feel there is no answer. Swarm Hosts meant that every Zerg player just wanted to slow the game down to a crawl. And who could blame them? If it worked, they were gonna win the game. G, Firecake takes game number one. And he knew that for a long time, as did we, but in the end, patience wins out. And sure, there was a cool match every once in a while, but most people were complaining that StarCraft just wasn't fun to watch anymore. This game is not the most entertaining game we've ever seen, to say the least. They are playing exactly as they should be. Uh at least for the last hour. Well, they're playing as they should be if they want to win. I don't know if the viewers would agree this is how they should play. <laughs> and as StarCraft's popularity began to wane, more and more players began to retire. I am not going to continue as a competitive player. Um, it's just gotten to the point where competition is not enjoyable for me anymore. Fan favorite Stefano, for example, jumped ship live on stream. The reign of Stefano has come to an end. That is an end of a very special era for that young man there. He's accomplished so much in his StarCraft II career. He's been the guy, he's been the player. He's made a lot of money playing StarCraft II. He's not enjoying it as much as he used to. By 2015, other games had risen up to take StarCraft's place in the esports world. Part of the swarm crippled the game, but Blizzard was hoping that their next expansion could revive it. Do you think? Maybe the Legacy of the Void has legs. Do we feel like that's the case? Absolutely. I think the biggest question will be how much and, and for how long. Um, it's always going to be one of those top five games. Over the next few years, Blizzard tried to make the game faster, to bring it more in line with the StarCraft that everyone fell in love with. But their next decision put the final nail in StarCraft's coffin. In 2016, Blizzard region locked StarCraft II tournaments. That meant that Korean players could only play with other Korean players in Korea for tournament purposes. It was supposed to introduce some regional diversity into StarCraft's pretty Korean-dominated competitive scene. Ladies and gentlemen, MMA, he is back. He is your season three World Championship Series Europe champion. What Blizzard didn't anticipate is that it created a sort of vacuum in South Korea. All of the new up-and-coming South Korean players could now only play against the veterans who'd been dominating the game for years. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's definitely unfair, right, on an individual level. Uh, Koreans are subjected to a different set of rules than foreigners, a uh, much stricter set of rules. Like, intuitively, that will just strike a lot of people uh, as being unfair. In general, as the Korean scene has progressed, the lower tier and mid tier players have kind of all dropped out, whereas the top tier players are still playing. Without new blood, the game stagnated. Then sponsors began to drop out, moving on to more lucrative games like League of Legends, Dota, and CSGO. Later that year, Pro League dissolved. It was the longest running league in esports history. Korean players are not improving at the same rate as they have because mm -hmm. the team house structures have collapsed. They have less support in that aspect. They're all living on their own, essentially. And there's a lot less collaboration within the Korean scene as there used to be. The other problem, of course, is that real-time strategy games like StarCraft just aren't that popular anymore. They're fast-paced and complicated, and they don't really lend well to a pleasant viewing experience for a newcomer. Diehard StarCraft fans stuck it out, and the scene isn't without its bright spots. The game still has a following all over the world, with nostalgia keeping the grandfather of all esports afloat. But there's still that nagging what if. What if StarCraft didn't fail? And what, if anything, could bring it back to its former glory? In 2017, Blizzard made StarCraft free to play, and they introduced the War Chest, a crowdfunding initiative that attempted to make the esport more viable. But Blizzard can't turn back the clock. The fans are dedicated, and the game is still great, but it'll never be as huge as it once was. StarCraft will always be the granddaddy of esports, but its glory days are over. Thanks for watching. If you want more content like this, hit the sub button and ring that notification bell.
For unique bite-sized videos you won't find anywhere else, hit up our Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook pages.